we've got Asen Kostantinov, he's a research manager from MMC uh, Ventures, joining to talk about how them as a VC fund, why they've started looking into blockchain. They've just started recently investing in some blockchain companies. Why now? Why those companies? What inspired them to start looking at blockchain? And what about those specific companies it inspired their interest for investment? So Asen will be staying. It's, we try and make these cryptocurry live chats as interactive as possible. Thank you, Asen, for joining us from temporarily from Bulgaria, albeit they're normally London-based. And um, we're joined by Ryan Hanley, who was the MD of uh, Token, Market, Token Market, a crypto firm who's helping out on the crypto carry live chats with some deep probing questions. So Asen, over to you if you can give a brief introduction. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, hi, everyone. It's great. It's great to, to be here. And thanks uh, very much for having me for this uh, live session. I must say I've been a fan of CryptoCurry for, for some time now and found the sessions that Eric organizes very interesting and, and tasty above all. Uh, so looking forward to getting the, the live version soon. So I'm just going to start with a few words uh, about uh, myself and, and MMC. I started my career as an aerospace engineer and as many of us do, quickly, quickly turned uh, to the dark side of finance. So after uni, I spent um, six years at Barclays with four and a half of those as an equity analyst covering European media and internet sectors. In that role, I was basically advising institutional clients, the likes of pension funds, hedge funds, big asset managers, about the investment opportunities concerning companies in European media uh, or internet. At the end of uh, 2018, I joined MMC and I lead the research activities at the fund. The other hat that I wear is uh, leading the blockchain and crypto focus of the fund. And that is why I have the, the pleasure to talk to Ryan and, and Erica today. So about MMC, as Erica already said, we are a London-based VC focusing on early stage uh, software investments. We have half a billion dollars under management currently across three funds. And I'll share a bit more about that um, in a minute. We have 53 portfolio companies in total and 22 members of the MMC team. Above all, central to our values is the notion of forming deep partnerships and being deeply invested in our companies. And this is not just in monetary terms, but also in terms of understanding um, their industries, understanding uh, the journey that they're going through and the time required to build a, a large business. And over the 20 years that we've been on the market, We've accumulated an extensive network and experience that helps us support the companies effectively. We also have a research driven approach to, to venture investing, which is a major differentiator for us. This means we build a capability to understand the technologies coming through and use, uh, use that to investigate the opportunities across the markets that we are investing in. So we are attempting to figure out how technologies will drive change and develop and we're trying to develop a, a knowledge that is as good as um, that of, of the entrepreneurs that we back. Just on that point, Asin, um, how big is your research team? Um, and and you know, how do you kind of, how do you divide that up across various sections that you guys are interested in? Yeah, we, so the, the, co the, the research team effectively spans the whole investment team. You know, I coordinate and lead a lot of the projects, but most of the Junior members of the team, as well as the senior members of the team, are involved in kind of doing doing the work and, and trying to stay on top of the of the trends in in particular sectors and, and verticals. And okay. it's a really it's a really live sort of kind of ongoing work that we do. We we try to live and breathe certain spaces that we think are presenting interesting opportunities. And um, just out of interest, the reason I bring this up is because I had a really interesting email literally yesterday from a guy at EY mm -hmm. asking me to go back to him and tell him all about what happened in the FCA regulation for the sandbox, because that was then going to happen within Spain. And I was just wondering, as a VC, obviously, how are you sort of surfacing bits of information? Because obviously you have certain companies within areas. You know, do you kind of delve into the founders, gain their knowledge uh, within certain sectors and look at other companies? Do you have this kind of hub and spoke approach do you blindly send emails to people like me 
<laughs> and ask for all of that experience and just to, to sort of surface that stuff up. Just, just interested to, to, to find yeah. out what your approach yeah. is. Yeah, and that, that is a very good question and something that we've wrestled with. So the, the easy answer is all of the above, basically. We do, where possible, use the expertise that is uh, existing within the portfolio. Um, next, we obviously have quite an extensive network that we've developed over these uh, 20 years, and that's the other thing that we tap into often. We also use um, external services like, like Gartner, which can be quite helpful when you're trying to quickly get up the learning curve on a particular space or technology. And of course, in, in, in certain situations, we also try to reach out to people that are uh, sitting outside of our network and, and try to get their, their advice and opinion on, on things. So, so yeah, it, it's quite a, quite a mix and match approach depending on, on the issue at hand. And as you, can, as you kind of alluded to, it, it's very difficult with sort of a, 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 smaller, a, a small team to be on top of everything that's going on. But this is kind of the capability that we've developed to, to very quickly try and, and, and look at the, the issue that needs, needs figuring out. So getting to the, to the source of the issue and how we can quickly learn about that. That's a capability that we've developed over the past uh, four or five years that we've been focusing on, on this research-driven approach. And oftentimes, you know, the, the research could be spurred by a deal that we're looking at. And, you know, in, in, in other situation, it's um, a proactive sort of activity on our part to just scan and, and monitor developments across, across different spaces. I imagine as you're kind of researching a, a certain sector or certain companies within a, a specific sector, there's probably a number of touch points along that, that kind of journey. Would you be able to sort of give us an instance of maybe how long it may take for you to research a, a certain area or company be, before you kind of would trigger? How, how long that kind of pathway might be? How many touches there might be along that kind of pathway with the, with the founder? Yeah, so it very much depends on how broad the area is. Something like AI or, or blockchain, which are, which are horizontal technologies, take quite a lot of time to get on top of. And uh, I'll share some of, some of my experience in doing so later today on blockchain. In other cases, when you have a very defined problem and some experience within the team having tackled or worked on a particular, within a particular space, in the past, then you're able to pinpoint sort of the, the questions that need answering and you can get right down to it. But usually the, the process is kind of, it starts with the definition of exactly what do we need uh, to get out of at the end of the process. You know, if it's about a, a company, then it, it's about kind of figuring out the market dynamics, competitive position, how does this both for the commercial development of the company, where do we think the market is going in the future, et cetera. And it's not necessarily trying to get a definitive answer on all these questions, because by definition, a lot of these are open questions that are quite difficult to find a, a yes or no answer to. It's more about reducing the unknown unknowns. So when, when, we, when we look at a particular deal, for example, we usually like to think of three different things, you know, the known knowns, the known unknowns, and the unknown unknowns. And with, with during the diligence process and with some of the research that we do, you're essentially trying to increase the first category, the known knowns, and reduce, dial down the third category, unknown unknowns, which are basically the things that can come and surprise you. So it's, it's fine to have known unknowns that you, you need to sort of develop a hypothesis uh, about or take an assumption on, but it, it, it's much more difficult if you have things that surprise you later on. We are trying actively to, to reduce that. Okay. And, and in terms of sort of your, your own specific angle on, on when you look to invest, are you the, the kind of the type of VCs who, you know, you're looking for that quite contrarian, big picture, one to zero type company. So let's say PayPal who changes payments, but breaks a few rules along the way. Or are you more conservative in terms of, you know, looking at kind of the, the size of the fund and how long that will go on for and ensuring you can get an exit? What's, what's typically the, the, sort of the strategy that you, you look at? Yeah, by definition, I mean, by, you know, being VC, early stage VC, we, we're probably more geared towards the, the first category, trying to get those big winners, the zero to one successes. And, and that's what 
that's what we're especially trying to do with our seed and, and pre-seed fund, you know, trying to gauge which of these sort of big markets that are going to be disrupted and what are the innovative sort of companies that are popping up that we need to develop a relationship early on with where, you know, the, the potential reward at the end, it, it could, be, could be disproportionately high. And as, a, as, a, as an asset class, I guess, VC is mostly about looking for those zero to, to, to one sort of story, success stories. As you go later in the sort of investment journey, you know, growth equity, for example, then people are starting to, to probably reduce the risk. It naturally decreases as you get more visibility and, and starting to, though, see a, a slightly reduced opportunity for return as well. But early on, it's, de- it's definitely uh, about looking for those um, sort of zero to one success stories. And, and, and seeing as you're kind of going into those zero to ones, are, are you typically involved in sort of, uh, you know, the, the follow on rounds? Is there, is there maybe an example, you, you know, out, maybe outside of crypto, because I know that's something you guys have really started digging into now, but maybe just give us a, a bit of a picture of a, you know, a company you've gone into, maybe a series A, a seed, and, and how that's sort of progressed. I don't know if any of yours have started to come out into the sort of the C's, the D's, the looking to go public, but, but maybe you could add some comments mm-hmm. to that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think a good, a good example of that is, is a company that hopefully a lot of the people on the call will be familiar with. It's, it's called Gusto. It's a, a recipe box delivery business in the UK. So we, we first invested in that company in 2013 when it was basically the founders kind of starting the business out of, out of the uh, founders living room. So that was out of the first seed fund that, that we had back in, the, back in uh, 2013. And uh, you, you, you're able to basically bet, bet on, a, on a quite, you know, it, it's a difficult sort of decision to see whether a category like recipe meal box kits in 2013 will turn out to be uh, a big thing. Sure, there were a few players already starting across Europe, but it wasn't um, kind of a done deal uh, at all. It was a market that was uh, forming. But having invested in that business, and of course, we were impressed by the founders, we were, we were actually able to follow through and kind of participate in, in many of the following follow-on investments, including the kind of series A rounds and, and later on, to support the business over the, the, over the past seven years, uh, to the point where now it's, it's, a leading, it's the leading recipe box business in the UK and quite possibly, you know, a leading brand on a, on a global scale. It, but it, it has surpassed by far uh, in the UK its main competitor, HelloFresh, and has, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the early theses that we had both about the space and also about Gusto differentiation with the spa- in the space uh, being its capability to, to apply AI to a lot of the operational aspects of the business that will help it increase the offering of kind of the variety that, that it offers to consumers, as well as reduce things like food waste and also the idle time in its, in its warehouses. That, that these have all turned out to be, to be true. Not to say that they weren't kind of hiccups along the way that happens in any company's journey, but it's, it's really rewarding to see a company go from literally a, a baby being born to actually an adult that can walk on its own, their own uh, feet. Just to interject quickly for anyone who's joined recently, we've got a Q&A function. If you just go to the bottom of your screen, you can type in any questions at any stage into the Q&A function or any other comments you want to make in the chat. There's been a few more recent joiners. But one question to interject you with, Asen. Yasser is asking, what is a prereq for investment in a project? Can you just give some details? Have you got any more specifics that you look at? Uh, of course, of course. It's, so let me go because I have uh, something I can show here. Th- this is basically a very high level of the things that we're looking for uh, in a business. And I have to say it does vary across different stages. Investing you know, in a pre-seed company that's been established is different than uh, investing in, in Series A, even though both of these could be thought of as early stage investing. But one of the kind of most important factors, especially early on, is, is the team. And as I said, in my previous role, 
I, I used to analyze and advise on public company investment. So it's very interesting to see the contrast between public company investing and early stage investing. You know, startups are not really companies. I'd say they're a, they're a group of founders on a mission to execute a shared vision about the world. Uh, so, you know, in, in this regard, it's very important to assess the founders, their unique insight, and understand, understand why they're uniquely positioned to deliver on the vision that they've set out. And of course, you have to assess if they have the perseverance and agility required mm-hmm. for the journey. Because as I just uh, demonstrated, you know, with Gusto, there will be periods of, of difficulty. There will be many kind of COVID recessions in, in a company's journey that they need to, to successfully deal with and, and navigate. And having a, a solid team that is, that is visionary and agile is one of the key prerequisites. And that's definitely something that we focus heavily on. And one thing that we've also learned over the past 20 years is that diversity is a real strength when building a company. So we are actively seeking that in, in finding founding teams and diversity can mean a lot of things you know it can mean diversity of, of backgrounds be it on a it can be a racial diversity or gender diversity it can be diversity in sort of careers but it's it's a real asset to the team so we are very much focused on that the the other big factor that i want to sort of highlight is is the second bullet point here and that's having a a great market. And, and that means a market that has a lot of potential customers that are growing at a, at a high rate and are demanding the product that you're building. In fact, in VC, there is, there is a school of thought that is saying that a great market is the single most important prerequisite for, for success. I think Andy Ratcliffe, the founder of Wealthfront and, and Benchmark, said something along the lines that when a great team uh, meets a lousy market, the market wins. When a lousy team meets a great market, the market again wins. When a great team meets a great market, then something truly special happens. And, and these are often you know, the big successes that people, people hear about. So this is where we, we take a great care um, to properly diligence the market dynamics uh, of, of the potential deals. So, you know, it's, it's really important when pitching to focus on the unique vision that you have for the particular market, explain why the team are best positioned to execute on that vision and why now is the right time to do it. I think communi- communicating that well goes quite a long way. One, well, one super quick more question and then we'll, we'll go back onto the crypto blockchain space. I know how much you've stressed in the past that you like to meet teams in person to get a feel for them. Yeah. And, and to you know have that human contact before investing, how has that changed your decisions or investments now in lockdown? Very good question, and uh, yeah, to be to be frank, that was something that was a, a question we uh, asked ourselves when COVID started and we had to go fully remote. Not that remote working was was foreign to us, uh, quite a lot of our meetings over Zoom, remotely, etc. But usually in the in the process of conducting diligence or you know conduct, doing a deal you put some emphasis on meeting the founders usually meeting them at their place of work because that can give you a lot of um, good insights about the dynamics in the team you know that that is very difficult to get um, over zoom so that was a genuine question that we had and the way we've dealt with it is to try to get as close to the real life as possible, which, which essentially means trying to have a lot of different touch points. Uh, maybe, you know, if in the past you've had, I don't know, 10, 10 meetings or 10 touch points when you're doing a, a deal, let's say a kind of a, a big series A deal. Now with Zoom, you're trying to, to have 20 of those and you're trying to spend as much time as, as possible with the founders in a, in a sort of non-formal uh, uh, pitching environment. So things like having having coffee and, and, and going for a long time, just chatting about about the world and and you know the company and how they how they feel in the current situation, etc. And that is of course not a replacement for the for the live interaction, but it does get allow you to get a, a better feel. And lately, when when some of the lockdown rules in the UK have been relaxed 
We've also tried to have those social distanced one-to-one meetings in, in parks and, and, and have, you know, walks in, in the park with, with the founder to try to get that feel. But it's definitely something that takes a bit of getting used to, you know. That said, we, we've done a couple of deals that were fully remote over that period. So, you know, I'm, I'm very happy about, about that. Very good. I'm just conscious, uh, obviously, because we have so many things that we want to go into. And really, the, the thing I think a lot of people here are here to sort of really get a good grip and understanding of is, is to really just bring you into the, the crypto and blockchain world. Um, Absolutely. So, you know, Let me we stop know- my screen. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Let's get the slides away. So obviously, MMC, you've had some tremendous <laughs> success in an early stage VC. You've obviously, Gusto's been you know, almost a unicorn, I imagine, by now. And especially after COVID, it's done incredibly well. But not many traditional VCs have entered into a pure blockchain crypto type company. We've had the crypto VCs, debatable. But as I say, a more traditional player like yourself, we sort of see few and far between. We've seen A16Z, obviously sort of very much in sort of the bleeding edge VC company have been out there making big waves, raising a very large fund recently as well. It would be great to get a bit more background in terms of what first led you into exploring the market and, and then some of the considerations around obviously your first investment, which happened a bit earlier this year in Copper. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So what led us to explore blockchain was we, we've had this focus on kind of enabling technologies. And the, the, the first one that we spent a lot of time on was, was AI. And that, that was a focus for us in terms of investment and, and continues to be a focus. I mean, AI is quite ubiquitous today. And when you think about uh, another technology that can have a similar, if not bigger impact, there aren't many other to, to, that, that come to mind. You know, it's, it's probably blockchain. And the other one that we're very kind of interested in is, is quantum computing. Uh, but quantum seems to be a bit further, kind of further in the future. So, you know, blockchain was, a, was an excellent candidate for us. That said, it, it was not a, a slam dunk uh, so to say, there was a healthy skepticism across the team. And that's not surprising, having seen what happened, you know, in 2017 and all the bad press that crypto and blockchain got. And I hadn't been super close to the space. I did keep a, an eye on it. And I, I vividly remember looking at my Bloomberg terminal over, you know, 2017 and seeing companies changing their name to having crypto in their title and then the share price popping up 500%. I think there was a specific... Long Island, Long Island, Ice tea company went exactly. to a Long Island blockchain. That, that's oh, company. I think it went up 400%. 500%. Yeah. 500%. Yeah, exactly. That's the one. And then also I had a lot of friends kind of talking to me about this as well. And then we also, uh, we, we, all, we all saw how this sort of ended. So there was a lot of healthy skepticism in the team. And the first thing sort of that I needed to do is understand whether, you know, is there any real value that, jo- that the blockchain provides uh, and do that sort of with a, with a careful research of other technology to some extent, but also the ecosystem, you know, get to talk to some of the people that are living and breathing the, 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 the ecosystem. And sort of the conclusion of that first kind of dip was that there is no question that technology is early and, and the space is, is still rather immature. But I thought the sort of crypto winter that followed after 2018 was, had quite a positive impact on the space, as I've alluded to in, in uh, the blockchain report that we published in, at the end of April. So, you know, drilling holes into blockchain propositions or crypto propositions is very easy because the technology is kind of still developing and the space is, is somewhat immature. It's almost similar you know, to drilling holes in the internet experience back in the beginning of the 90s, right? But our job as investors is, is to be able to understand when a technology uh, nears that inflection point, when things are starting to accelerate and things are starting to happen. So in this regard, I sort of came up with four pillars that helped me build conviction that blockchain is on the cusp of, of achieving or starting that, that inflection point journey. The first one was that you know, despite there still being a lot of work to be done, the technology was, was maturing. You know, the, of, all the peop- 
all, all the people that I spoke to, uh, including some um, sort of analysts in the space and, and analysts, Gartner and enterprises, no one was really saying that the projects that they were working on were that limited by, by the nascent technology. It, it, it was more to do with some other, especially when talking about enterprises, it was more to do with organizational issues rather than technology itself. And it's easy also to see that technology is developing fast just by the sheer number of the developers uh, working on, on, on the problems. You know, even after 2018 and, and the drop in crypto prices, I think that the full number, the full the developers that were working full time on Ethereum, let's say, actually stayed constant and is actually increasing slightly. Then you you look at job surveys in in Silicon Valley. The the positions for blockchain engineers went up 500 percent between 2018 and 2019. And all these stats can only mean one thing: that that people are, are kind of building and they're building things very quickly. So it was clear that that a lot of the technology challenges were going to be solved. Then the the next key point was the talent and the entrepreneurs in the space actually maturing. And this was, this was the key point about the crypto winter. I, in, in my conversations with a lot of the startups, you were clearly able to see uh, them taking a more pragmatic approach. It wasn't just about this ICO. It wasn't just about um, sort of the token price increasing. In fact, a lot of them were openly ditching their token plans, which was understandable at the time. Um, and instead, they were focusing on the business case. They were focusing on the return that they're going to deliver for their kind of investors and their customers. They were focusing on things like UI and UX. And coupled with that, there was also an impressive quality of, of talent joining space. You know, I was regularly coming uh, across people that at, at quite high positions in their career in financial services, let's say, that, that are leaving the industry to, to join the crypto sort of space, the, the blockchain space, and start developing things in that, in that ecosystem. So that was another clear signal. The third thing was to do with adoption and how enterprises were looking at the technology. And if you look at uh, some of the kind of surveys that, they, that have been happening over the years, and the Deloitte one is, is quite good. It came out, the latest edition came out um, two or three weeks ago. It's clear that enterprises are taking a lot more serious look at, at the technology. You know, they, a lot of them are, have been experimenting with it for years now, and now they're on the cusp of actually putting those experiments into, into production. And I think the, the tagline of this year's Deloitte survey was that block, uh, enterprises are no longer seeing blockchain as a, as a kind of the future or, or they're seeing they're actively experimenting with it, but they're seeing blockchain as an integral part of their future success. So they, they're very heavily focusing on, on the technology. And the final point was around regulatory clarity improving. You know, in, in verticals such as financial services, regulators, I think, are increasingly spending time trying to get to know the space and trying to include, um, uh, include cryptocurrencies and other digital assets in, in, in the regulations. And this naturally provides more certainty to entrepreneurs and, and fosters innovation. So we kind of these four just pillars. On that point, just on that point, Asin, so just, just to pull you up on that one. So the regulation, it's come in thick and fast, I think, over the last two years, you know, I think because of the size of some of the markets mm -hmm. and what have you, that has happened. However, <laughs> most recently, some of the most successful projects have been within DeFi. And one of those big ones, which doesn't do any KYC or IML, are the likes of Compound and Balancer, where there's these wonderful governance tokens that people are yield farming at the moment and has you know, created this wonderful, I mean, let's say experiment, where we've got this very, very interesting, truly decentralized platform. What are your thoughts on, on, on that area? I think maybe this is probably a two-part question. One, in terms of, is it sustainable if it keeps growing at the same speed it has done? Mm -hmm. And two, what's MMC's own particular outlook on this new asset class? So not a direct equity investment, 
but looking at something, you know, as A16Z did with, with compounds, taking a large amount of, of these tokens, which have use, which are seen as utility tokens, but haven't been pre-mined. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously DeFi is an extremely, extremely interesting space, but, but let me talk about the, the regulatory point that you brought up. I think when it comes to regulation, it's a question of materiality, right? It's um, a question of how big of a risk that that particular space poses. And as far as most regulators are concerned, they are just starting probably to notice DeFi on their radar because DeFi really started probably end of 2017, if not over 2018. So, you know, with the, with the pace that re a regulator moves, they've only now seen this thing come uh, on their radar because now you, you're having kind of significant amount of money being held in that space. And even when I say significant, it's significant relative to where the space was two years ago. But if you, if you look at a global scale, you know, a few billion locked in where people are, yes, turning that quite, quite heavily and trading that quite heavily. But at the, at the same time, the, these are not huge amounts of money for, for a regulator. And therefore, I think it will, it will take time for them to, to crunch on their space. But they're doing a lot of things around, you know, how tokens are treated. And both in the US and in the UK, they've the tokens, they are differentiating between which tokens can be considered securities and need to fall under the kind of securities laws and which, which can't. And that's an important point when it comes to, let's say, the compound token and the way they did things. You know, if you, and, and I'm not an expert in this, so correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but I think if a particular business issues a token, and the governance of that business is kind of centralized. So all the decision making and everything is driven centrally by the team and the founders. Then the, their token, if distributed to the community uh, or, or to the public, could be considered to be a security. And then it can fall under you know, more strict um, regulation. However, if the token is actually distributed and with that distribution of the token, you're actually um, distributing the governance and the decision making over the, you know, over the, the business, then you, you're you're essentially creating a, a governance token which doesn't fall under the the security the security regulations. So that's something which Compound did did very well, I'd argue, and they're probably one of the kind of first examples of of companies that have that have created that, and I think this is just the beginning and, and many will follow because you know you're seeing the real promise of of what a token economy does to to a business essentially you're able to incentivize your users and, and supporters to invest uh invest time into sort of governing or opining on on the future of, of the business so you're at the same time an owner of the business but also the user and there are incredible network effects that can be achieved now, when it comes to the, you know, the, uh, everything that we saw in the last two weeks with the compound price going up and down, I think these are just things that will happen in the beginning of any sort of token distribution when the supply is somewhat constrained and, and different sort of volatility, different actions can, can spike volatility in, into the token price. But as, as more tokens are sort of distributed, things I think will settle and, and the volatility will, will flatten. Do you, do you think this kind of play can only be done by an A16Z type company? So if you kind of look at this regulatory uncertainty with compounds, you, you know, you, I think it almost goes back to where A16Z have been very, very smart and they've looked at the SEC who've come out and said that Ethereum, although potentially initially centralized, has now become decentralized based on the number of nodes. They've kind of taken this and then taken a play where they still have a huge amount of these tokens. It's like 350,000 of them, I believe, are owned by A16Z. But just because of the sheer size of the funds that they have underneath them and the success stories that they have and the access that they have, it almost feels like a company like that can take that bet. They have the lawyers, they have the ability to be able to string things out, they're able to take on the SEC if it really comes down to it. They've got a vested interest in a number of other projects. Would someone like MMC, I know, you know, you guys have done very, very well, probably not quite the scale of an A16Z. Would you take that kind of bet? 
do you see others in the space who would be willing to sort of put their their nose above the parapet or do you think now it's a select few who can really you know invest in that kind of way in this type of new asset i i mean for for starters a, a lot of the regulations that define which which tokens are going to be treated as securities and which not are kind of the same for everyone right you know things like the how we test that i described with you know the government where the government sits whether does it where, whether it sits in the community or with the team is is a, a test that applies to to all so if done something they they've kind of prepared themselves with the structure of their of their fund so that they can invest in in sort of some of the the other tokens like, you know, as you said, Ethereum and, and Bitcoin, et cetera. And they're by far not the only traditional fund that has done so. You know, Union Square Ventures uh, has done something similar. And I think more and more traditional funds will, will attempt such, such a change. But I think most people are waiting for some regulatory clarity. When it comes to MMC in particular, I don't think we'll shy away from, from doing something like this. My, my kind of initial sort of thoughts on this are, are slightly different. It's let's understand the space and let's understand the technology and the potential of the technology before we add another layer of complexity on top of, on top of it, which is what comes with tokenomics and investing in tokens. Um, not, to, not to say that, you know, during the ICO boom, there were you know, the tokens come with, with a lot of, how can I say, bad, bad baggage. And, and then and they kind of introduce definitely a lot more complexity to a deal. So from our perspective, I think we've, we've identified that there is enough opportunity for us to make equity investments before we need to tap into, into tokens. And we're using that period of time to space carefully and see exactly how, how it evolves. Because the token models are also evolving, the way tokens are distributed, etc. So I'm sure when the, the, the right time comes, we'll be, we'll be prepared for that. Yeah. That, that's yeah, basically I, feel like, I, I feel like the securities lawyers are going to have another feast again in, a, in about six months' time as this really starts to spiral up. And that's and my own personal opinion. The lawyers I, always seem to do very well in this area. I must say that a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of teams have also shied away from, from tokens themselves. I think there is a, somewhat of an acceptance in the space now that you don't launching a token together with the launch of your product or business is actually not a good idea precisely for that point because you know you want to build a business first you want to build a product market fit first before you overcomplicate things because otherwise what what use uh, a, a token has if you don't have a, a business so a lot of including compound a lot of businesses are actually taking a, a much more considered approach of building building a product market fit first building a, a community which is akin to following sort of the open source model uh, of company building. Once you have a, a product market fit, once you have a strong community that is already contributing to, to your product and is actively participating in the ecosystem and promoting you, then having uh, distributing a token that is able to decentralize some parts of the governance of your company to the community is a logical step. And that's exactly sort of the, the, the playbook that Compound have, have, uh, have used. No, absolutely. It's, 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 it's really interesting, that incentive-based model, as I say, you know, being brought in later on in that company's life cycle as well. And I think we're going to see more and more of that as sort of the next six, 12 months continues. So just going back a little bit, you know, we kind of, we floated around it a little bit, but obviously mm -hmm. you guys have now made your first equity-based investment, Series A within Copper. Um, yeah. it, it's great to understand a little bit more about why those guys? There seems to be an abundance of custody solutions out there, you know, various different jurisdictions, you know, a lot of the, the tech in terms of settlement is sort of open source. You know, what really drew you to, to, to those guys and, and what really kind of stood out? Yes. Absolutely. Uh, so that's a, that's a very good question, especially uh, when it comes to how saturated the space is. So when, when I was looking at the interesting areas within blockchain and crypto, I sort of defined a, a framework in my mind that you, you need to look at, because it, it's such a young space and it's evolving so quickly, it's, it's impossible to time things. I mean, in general, it's very difficult to time markets, but in this case, it's even more difficult. So 
the way you kind of need to approach the space is to invest in something that has sort of the uh, long-term potential, uh, something that will grow together with the space. And I sort of nicknamed this key, key things to mass adoption. So things that if crypto or blockchain becomes big, will you know, grow with the space, their prerequisites uh, for, the, for the space to grow. And th- these are things like you know, developer tools, uh, API tools, middleware to connect to multiple chains, infrastructure as a service, you know, blockchain as a service, on and off ramps, data analytic tools, key storage, you know, wallets, all these things need to be developed and they need to be adequate. They need to be as adequate as some of the other tools that we use outside of the blockchain space in order for blockchain and crypto to really take, take over the world, so to say. And within financial services, that at the moment remains the, the largest kind of vertical within, within blockchain, infrastructure is, is one such play. You know, there is quite a lot of focus now on, on some of these tokens that we discussed being treated as, as an asset class. And definitely we are seeing more and more signs that institutions, some of them are sort of native to crypto that started as a crypto hedge funds. Uh, some are also traditional institutions. They're, they're casting an eye to the, to the space and, and they're more and more interested in, in becoming involved. Um, so for, for, Capital markets uh, and institutional um, infrastructure is interesting because it's it's sort of play on adoption, uh, but secondly because it's a it's a significant market, and and custody kind of is is one part of the the, the this infrastructure play. You're right. There there are a lot of solutions out there, and I've I spoke to quite a few of the of the market players in kind of the course of just me getting up to speed on the space. And definitely the market at the moment is not that big. There probably is probably around 100 million revenues per year to, to go around these players. And I wouldn't be surprised if there are more than 60 or 70 global players in the institutional custody space. So, you know, when it, come, when it came to, to COPPA, it basically felt like the right team at the right time. There was definitely the backdrop of the market factors, you know, the, the adoption growing by institutions and infrastructure being the right place to invest. But also, you know, they had that unique vision about the space. Uh, while a lot of the other solutions were using technology as their main USP, um, the copper team financed knowledge of the re- legal and regulatory frameworks used in traditional finance in order to be able to expand the pie to some of these players. And that's, I, I thought, was quite interesting because if you look at the innovation in financial services, most of the innovation is purely kind of based on sort of new legal constructs. It's not uh, only driven by, by technology. So, you know, that, that unique sort of vision and insight, as well as their unique sort of experience, the founder, Dimitri Tokarev, was a CTO at Dolphin. He was one of the partners there. And he was very kind of attuned to some of the tech sort of technology issues in the, in the traditional uh, financial services space. And he had himself tried to launch a Bitcoin fund at Dolphin. And he saw how, how difficult that was, precisely because of some of the regulatory and, and um, legal issues. <clears throat> so with that insight, they had gone to market to launch a truly kind of innovative and leading proposition, which at the time, uh, and it's still called the World Garden. It basically allowed funds to uh, invest in crypto without being going into so, so the so-called self-custody mode which is a big no-no for sort of any investment manager. This means that you, you, you shouldn't be in full control of your client's funds at any point in time. That's uh, against the regulations. So they, using you know, the te- technology, but also some kind of legal knowledge, they actually came up with that con- construct. And that was a truly kind of innovative feature at that point in the market, which was then openly sort of copied by some of the other players in the space. And they had done that uh, with quite an efficient model. So looking at some of the other very high profile names, you know, the likes of Anchorage, companies like BitGo, even some of the MPC companies, Unbound, Curve, et cetera, 
five blocks, copper had raised quite a modest uh, sum of money. So they were really capital efficient. And that, that kind of unique insight combined with their ability to be agile and to build quickly and iterate quickly uh, was really, really appealing at the time. And I'd say that a lot of the sort of things that we've seen since the investment have, have continued to confirm those first impressions. You know, they, they continue to provide the market with, with market leading, leading features. And, and custody was definitely not at the core of our kind of thesis about, about investing in copper. That's almost their beachhead into the market. The broader vision is about creating that sort of capital markets infrastructure to do with pre-settlement, sorry, pre-trade, trading and post-trade that can allow more traditional market participants to, to come into the crypto space. And I think they're, they're definitely executing on, on, on that vision. You know, the latest product that they launched was quite well covered in the media. It's called Clearloop. And it's the only way, as far as I'm aware, you can move tradable assets to an exchange without actually waiting for blockchain confirmations. So essentially, a, a fund can trade with an exchange without moving the asset to that exchange. And that is quite, quite a unique uh, thing to have in, in, in the crypto space at the moment. Because for a lot of sort of high frequency trading funds, the capital efficiency that exists within the crypto space is really quite poor. The fact that you need to pre-fund your accounts at many different exchanges, because of course you want to, you want to trade on, on a lot of different exchanges because you, you want to be able to um, take advantage of the market dynamics and arbitrage opportunities, etc. But imagine that you need to put money on all the, every, every single venue. Well, that really, really limits the, the trading that you can do. And being able to trade out of a central single pot completely changes, changes the game, not to mention some of the counterparty risk implications. I mean, you're no longer vulnerable to, to an exchange going down and, and all the assets that you put at that, on that exchange going down with, with the exchange as well. It, it also has implications with regards to how quickly you can move and, and, and provide margin for, for different trades. And, and that can, can create further kind of opportunities for the, for the high frequency traders. But above all, it's actually the start of, a, of an ecosystem. So copper, starting with the walled garden and now continuing with, uh, with Clearloop, are actually cre creating an, an ecosystem that it's not necessarily locking the clients within just the copper solution. You know, they will open them and they are opening their uh, ecosystem to other custodians as well. And they really want to become just the, the settlement rails on which a lot of this kind of trading is done. Yeah. So quick question from me. The companies that you've invested in, how have you got about those? Have they approached you or have you actively gone out and researched them? It's, it's really a mix. So we, and if, if there is a blockchain startup, for example, or a blockchain company that wanted investment, what would, what would be their best tactic yeah. to get um, your attention? In, in, in general, the best, the best tactic is always to, see, to seek warm introduction. Not to say that a direct sort of inbound via email is, cannot be effective, but getting, getting that warm intro by somebody that, let's say I know, uh, some of my colleagues know, adds that extra level of credibility and, and brings the opportunity right at the top of your, of your sort of to-do list. Because on a daily basis, you know, we're getting so many different <clears throat> emails and, and inquiries. And naturally, you have to prioritize. So a lot of times, it takes longer to come back to those sort of inbound opportunities than to look at some of the warm introductions. Yeah. So warm introductions is the way to go. Back to your first question regarding whether we've actively pursued the companies, we've received introductions mm -hmm. about them. It's really a mix. I mean, in that research process that I outlined, when you're looking and, and uh, scanning the market, sometimes you set out to invest in one company, and by the end of it, you've identified that a competitor of theirs is better at the same time and is, is, uh, presents a better opportunity. So we've, we've also had cases like that. Okay. It's Thank very you. organic. Is there, is there a specific feature about crypto or blockchain companies that you would avoid like the plague and sort of that's part one of that question. And then part two has been elaborated on by 
Uh, Dominic, who, who's asking, how, how do you define specifically what a blockchain company is, or do you even need to? And he's, he's asking if he looks at the so-called blockchain unicorn companies like Bitfury, Circle, Coinbase, Kraken, Ripple, for example. One could argue that they're miners or exchanges and not necessarily blockchain companies per se. Do you have a filter on that or do you really not mind? Or you don't have any specific criteria about what constitutes blockchain or crypto? Yeah, I personally don't have, I'm not, I, I try to be not, not to be too rigid about it. So for me, I, I loosely uh, kind of name blockchain um, companies, those that are involved in the space in any shape or form. You're quite right. Uh, some of them have pretty much use a traditional uh, mm -hmm. technology as their backbone, sometimes use a traditional business model, but are actively participating in the space and are advancing the space. You know, a lot of the data companies uh, are, are doing that, for example. But to me, they're still kind of operating in this space. Um, mm -hmm. Therefore, they're a blockchain company. In terms of things that I, I, uh, I avoid, like, like plague, it's quite difficult to come up with something concrete. I'd say some of the tactics that were used back in the ICO days when companies are pushing their tokens and they're very much focused on kind of raising a big round rather than uh, how much value they, mm -hmm. they provide. Those 90% discounts, you didn't want any of that as a VC. <laughs> you know, those lovely buyback opportunities. Bounties, bounties, bounties paid to social medias. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Ten, you know, paying 10% for zero later on is uh, that that is expensive, I think. Uh, Rob um, is asking, you see many investor decks, what what really stands out for you? when you're filtering through the decks, uh, other than the warm introduction, what makes you put some forward for more DD for more due diligence? So in 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 the investor deck, it's it's about sort of telling and telling a story telling a story about why you are the right person or the right team to be working on the issue at hand, providing sort of a, a narrative as to what, what's your plan for the next um, sort of 12 to 18 months, what are the milestones that you've covered so far and how that moves you to, to, the, to the eventual goal. And the, the briefer the deck, the better. I guess it's, it's just all about providing an idea of, of a market opportunity and why you're the right person to work on it. And that's probably enough to kind of act as a teaser. And then the real sort of hook happens over a, a meeting or a, or a phone call. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, add to, to, to Dom's question a little bit more as well. So was it blockchain is this kind of all encompassing thing at the moment and potentially is going to be, you know, driving a number of different sectors. Are there any other particular elements of blockchain you know let's say gaming outside of finance that, that, that you're you're looking into so any particular you know movements underneath that yeah. big umbrella term that, that particularly are catching your attention definitely uh, i mean something that i've been personally quite excited about is digital identity and of course that can straddle some of finance but i i see it as a as a space on its own because it can interplay with many other verticals advertising and, and, and uh, regulation and compliance are just some of those. But I think we've been, you know, the, 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 there are so many privacy issues that have been highlighted over the past few years. Regulation is kicking in, people are becoming a lot more aware about their data. And it, it's, it's about time that we get a lot more control over our our data and our identity so the this idea of having sovereign identity where the the data sits with the user and the user provides access to the different parties that want to use that data is a much more efficient model both for the user but also for the companies because given the fines and the regulations a lot of companies these days are not willing to to hold all that uh, PII personal uh, identifiable data anymore. So uh, that, that's definitely uh, a space that I'm keeping a close eye on. Oh. But it's a, it's a difficult, it, it's a slow moving beast because of the sheer number of parties that need to be involved and the change that needs to happen. On the self-sovereign identity play as well, the thing that, that always would stri strike me there is you, you almost need a very centralized validator of that data before you can start passing bits of it out. And someone needs to be able to be that central source. And 
for me, it always led down to the path of, well, you almost need the government to be able to adopt this, to make this work, right? Um, or you need banks who have 20 years worth of history on someone who's had a, a, an account with them, which, well, a, a lot of the crypto people might be slightly against <laughs> if we went to the SSID and then went back into banking. I mean, what are your thoughts on how that, how that kind of comes about? Yeah, it, these are very good points. I mean, I've, I've seen both approaches used by, by companies actually or being suggested forward by, by companies. And look, similar to crypto, you know, the way I kind of see things are in stages. When you want to go from being super centralized and the whole model revolving around that to mm -hmm. going decentralized, that cannot happen in one go. It, it, such big changes on, on such important sort of systems in our daily lives don't occur in one go. Therefore, you need to create a bridge. And to me, a, a company that is launching a digital identity product in a particular vertical with some central counterparties acting as validators of that data mm -hmm. is perfectly acceptable, acceptable start. And then over time, you can think about, you know, how you decentralize that. But you're right. I mean, banks uh, are at the moment trusted uh, parties in the system that we've, we've defined. Government is another one. So they, they're very well placed to, to act as, as those validators. Um, I'm conscious we've got quite a few questions left and you've got a hard stop in 15 minutes. Two people now have asked about STOs, your thoughts about companies that have looked at an STO or raised through an STO, or would you even invest through that medium? To be honest, I haven't really looked at STOs that closely, mm -hmm. mainly because, you know, we, we, don't, we don't look at tokens at that point. But, but also it's, it's something that sort of became quite topical last year. And, mm -hmm. and I was trying to see when the dust settles exactly what forms those are going to take. Cool. No. I think um, one of the things to go into there as well is, you know, the things that are maybe closest to STOs at the moment is kind of traditional crowdfunding. You know, would you go in on the same terms as a retail investor, as a VC? I think that's maybe the wider question on if you'd go into an STO at this current state. No, usually, I mean, we usually try and, and get slightly, you know, not, not different terms, but the terms that we invest under are usually proportional to the sort of risk and the investment that we make. You know, a real investor might put a more modest uh, sum of money, whereas the, a VC provides a sizable capital and it needs some, you know, framework to protect that investment. And therefore you, you're taking slightly different terms. It's, it's the same, uh, to be frank, with, with some kind of angel investors, which come in earlier than VCs. Um, we've got Which, a couple, sorry, go um, on, Ryan. Well, just, just on that point, I was going to say, to, the way STOs have been initially seen has been this kind of Series A, C-type funding in view of then structuring later on different rounds and having more transparency. Do you think potentially STOs, I mean, they seem to be taking a bit of a turn, but do you think that may be useful for you to have more clarity on the cap table when coming into Series A's, if STOs are able to facilitate that? Yeah, I mean... Cap table clarity is definitely important to us. At the end of the day, you want to make sure that there is a healthy cap table out there and that entrepreneurs at every single stage mm -hmm. have enough equity to incentivize them to continue to work hard for the, for the future of the business. Uh, so in that regard, yeah, I think it, it's a good point. We've got a couple questions around the theme of if they have unproven entrepreneurs or startups trying to get investor confidence or how do they know specifically what gap to market in and to secure a VC's confidence? Could you just give a couple comments on that? Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we are broadly speaking quite agnostic when it comes to experience. It's not that we're not gonna, we don't look at kind of founders that don't have any experience. Clearly having some previous experience provides you with useful sort of data points, but that mm -hmm. can cut both ways. So, it's, it's going back to the same sort of things that we discussed earlier, having uh, kind of a unique insight about the market, uh, understanding why, you know, your product is needed and what kind of gap it fulfills in the current market, mm -hmm. and then it being able to articulate that well in a narrative and, and, and vision about the company. Cool. 
One question from Paul Lewis. What are your views on the institutional adoption of crypto? Do you think we're looking at a tipping point now with some of the, the bigger traditional hedge funds looking mm -hmm. at the space or what is needed for institutional adoption and acceptance? I think I, I'm optimistic. I mean, otherwise I wouldn't uh, keep been pushing for, for copper. I think it will take time. And, and there are many different considerations pointing in that direction. Firstly, the market is still somewhat small. You know, when you, when you think about, you know, Bitcoin being, what, 200 billion, 300 billion dollar market and all crypto being, you know, 50 billion more, that is quite small for, by, by the standards of traditional sort of hedge funds, for example. So they wouldn't be able to come and play in this market in the same way that they play in, in, in the traditional space. They are also waiting for better infrastructure in place so that they can do and, and follow similar strategy, st strategies that they follow in the sort of traditional world. The, the next big thing is definitely regulation and um, getting more clarity on that front. So I definitely think you know, the market is progressing. We've seen mm -hmm. a number of important developments, in, especially during COVID, you know, with Tudor making investments and, and, and positive noises. You know, Fidelity has established now its presence quite firmly in the space. Uh, and there, there are good indications that financial advisors are also looking at this for some of their sort of the savings of some of their clients, especially in the US. So things will progress, but it, it's not going to happen overnight. And that, that, is, that is good because, you know, the, the, the system needs time to adjust itself so that when the transition happens, it's actually done on a firm basis rather than be building a sort of house of cards, the way it happened a bit with, with the ICOs. Yep. One question, we're getting towards the end. What are the main points you've learned from that investments that haven't worked out that you'd have liked? What is the biggest failure? What's been your biggest mistake? Can you talk about that? I guess, you know, I, I've been in the firm for one and a half years, so I naturally haven't seen... Uh, You're backing away from this failure straight away, Asin. Come on. I, I, you know, it's, it's often, often it's about some of these unknown unknowns that I touched upon in the beginning. It's those kind of factors that you haven't been able to assess when you, when you start kind of the journey with a company so that you can watch out for them. And protect against them. Other times, I, I guess the two sort of most common factors are something in the team doesn't work out the way uh, you thought it would. Either you know the founders are not are, are getting are not getting along very well, or the other thing is the market is just not as big as you thought. And we we've seen that in in a few in a few occasions. Thank you. You, uh, you haven't had any dog walking apps that you've gone into like SoftBank. There's been nothing that you, you know, surely there must be one you can highlight. You don't have to name them, but maybe, a, you know, no, what the I, concept was and why it didn't work. Yeah. I mean, market is, is one, is, is like an example. I mean, you, you start with a product that is getting good initial traction. You have a good hypothesis of why this will continue, but then something about the industry is not turning out the way you thought it would that turns into the sort of product adoption flattening out and the growth not materializing and the problem with vc kind of back startups is that you're always walking the fine line between basically putting enough fuel in in the business so that it's supercharged for for growth but if that growth doesn't materialize mm -hmm. then the cost base is so high that it cannot be easily sustained so you can't sustain long period of, of underperformance. And if, you, if that underperformance happens in a market that's not very forgiving, like today's market with COVID, then you might be in, in trouble. <clears throat> One oh, super like question from a... That, that, that answer, Asin, the, the, the <laughs> named company or, or, or market. Very well handled, though. Fair enough. Go on, Erica. Sorry. So one super quick question from Yasir, which I, I, I like. How does one get a warm intro to MMC? By Erica. <laughs> Through the Crypto Curry Club. I like it. Oh. Uh, Asin, so we've got one very important question for you. Seeing as this is a Crypto Curry live chat, 
and yeah. obviously we're waiting for crypto curry clubs to hopefully resume ideally this year <laughs> So, of course, the, the, the penultimate one that we always ask everyone us in. So, what is your favourite curry? <laughs> and the most important question. You, this one you have to answer. You can't go around it and talk you, about You will be you surprised by the answer. You will be surprised by the answer. And the answer is, I am not a super fan of curries. You know, it's just the Indian it's cuisine. Greening, Erica. Is a bit too spicy for me. So yeah, I, I don't have a favorite one. Yeah. Someone's just commented that you've just ended on a bad note. I know, I know. We have to fix that. Once yeah. the lockdown is over. Erica, when we're finally able to meet us in, in person again, we'll have to yes, do that. Indeed. Yeah. What inspired you to come to your first crypto carry then? It was a warm introduction. I was hearing about the, the club and how kind of Good, the network opportunities, the interesting talks. So that's why I, I decided to, to come and join you guys. Oh, I'm glad you did. Well, thank you very much for answering all of these questions. Like details perhaps for anyone that has to potentially reach out to you with their questions? Yeah, absolutely. They can, they can just email me on asin at mmc.vc. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for joining. Shame about the curry. There's, a, there's been a few boos about that, but I'm sure you'll be forgiven. Yeah, I'm looking forward to, to, you know, changing my opinion on that. I'm sure we can re-educate you. Awesome. Well, thank thank you, you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you very much for Ryan from joining all the way from Canada and thank Asen you. from joining from Bulgaria. Thank you, everyone. Have a, have a great one. And thanks to everyone for joining us, and hopefully we'll see people soon, indeed, at a real-life crypto curry. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.